All right, welcome back, everybody. We have our final chat of the day today, and Jason Wishnov is here from Iridium Studios. He's going to touch on phase two of something that we're always talking about, and that's, you know, you've got your pitch deck ready, but how are you going to deliver it properly? So your pitch is fine. Your delivery is not. As always, if you've got questions, pop them in the chat over on Discord or on whatever medium that you're watching us on right now, and we'll get everything live. Here you go. It's all you, Jason. I want to say thanks to Jay and Dan for setting all this up, and thank you all for being here. My name is Jason Wishnov, and I have a presentation for you. The presentation isn't that fancy, but its content sure is. The essence of a pitch is not really what this talk is about. As Jay mentioned, something that you guys hear very, very frequently and you guys see very frequently is exactly what to put in your pitch deck. And frankly, there are people out there that have more experience than me, that have done it more times. Listen to them, trust them. What's in your pitch deck is incredibly important, but often overlooked is that it's not just about your product, it's about you. You have to sell you. You have to go up there and be an excellent, charming, beautiful human being because people ultimately know that they're going to be working with you for months, if not years at a time, and they want to know that that relationship is going to be fruitful. The PowerPoint itself is bad. Don't worry about the PowerPoint. It's gray. It's got black text. It's not the focus here. Uh, obviously, your uh, pitches are going to be great. Requisite introductory part. Why are you listening to me? Why am I delivering this to you? I'm just some guy. Um, the bullet points here aren't really relevant. What is relevant is my experience, and particularly one particularly interesting thing about me. Uh, I am the head of an indie studio, Iridium Studios, but I am also an actor. Uh, I studied a lot of theater in college, and I've done a lot of voice acting in the industry itself. I'm a voice actor in League of Legends. I've done a bunch of anime and audiobooks and infomercials and a bunch of other nonsense as well. And I think that those skills are very, very transferable to being up in front of a group of people, having the stage, and making sure that you can make them feel comfortable during a presentation. My company, Iridium Studios, is located here in Los Angeles. We're about 11 people large right now. I can talk about my particular experiences a little bit later. I do want to focus on this just now. But suffice to say, I was very, very fortunate. Earlier this year, before the pandemic started, I was able to pair up with a mid to larger size publisher. We were funded for a few million. We're hard at work now every day. I'm, my guys are up there wondering where I am right now. I told them it's fine. Um, so we're, we're making a JRPG right now. We're very, very excited about that. Very fortunate. I'm going to bring some of that experience in pitching. It must have been dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Get ready for failure until you finally succeed that one time. And man, does it feel real good when it does. So let's jump in very quickly. The basics. Accoutrement, one of my favorite French words. What do you go into this thing with? I know a lot of this is going to sound basic. It's going to be annoying. But please, you'd be surprised how many people don't pay attention. First of all, the most basic of basics hygiene please brush your teeth wear some deodorant if you're going to wear cologne or perfume a little bit goes a long way do not douse yourself get a haircut most uh salon artists will tell you that a haircut takes a good haircut takes three days to settle so plan that out three days in advance go to your favorite barber make sure that stuff looks great it does matter oh and shave shaving is important too all of that stuff clothing um, this has probably been brought up for you guys before i do think clothing is somewhat dependent on uh to whom you're pitching Obviously, if you're going into a much more serious venture capital discussion with people who are very acquainted with the business world, you're going to want to wear, if not a suit, then at least something very, very business. Um, but if you're going onto the more creative side of things, if you're talking with a publisher, which has probably been most of my experience, you might want to wear either business casual or something a little bit closer to what I would call creative genius wear, uh, because that's what they expect. Netflix pitches are all about this. Uh, something akin to a very stylish hoodie or jacket often work well in this. I put two examples here on the right. They look well put together. I'm not a fashion consultant. Talk to your friend who's like really into that. They'll probably help you out. Great. Uh, layers. I have been in every temperature setting in these, these pitch meetings. Oftentimes the room changes, the AC is on and blasting. Other times it's broken and it's summer in Los Angeles. I've been in like 55 degree rooms. I've been in 90 degree rooms. Uh, sweat is a thing. No matter how accomplished or experienced you get, it's a physiological phenomenon. It matters to you. You're nervous. It's totally understandable. Just make sure you have a layer or two to prevent it from just like seeping through the shirt. It's happened to me once or twice. It's kind of embarrassing. No one brought it up, but I knew and they knew I knew it was weird. Use layers. Uh, you're probably bringing a laptop with you or some other kind of presentation hardware. 
don't bring a Jansport. In fact, I wouldn't recommend a backpack at all, but there are cool backpacks out there. I don't know. I would recommend investing in a nice messenger bag or laptop bag, leather, pleather, just something nice. It's worth the investment. Plus, you'll look cool. It, you'll, you'll look super put together. Highly recommend that. It does matter what you bring in here as much as it would be nice if it didn't. Moving on, from accoutrement is fumbling tech. Technology is the worst. Um, kudos to Dan, by the way, for making this a relatively seamless experience, but every single setup, AV setup, is different. Uh, there is a cat walking by right now. I don't know if you'll see him. Um, it's important that you make this as not awkward as humanly possible. What does that mean? Uh, it's okay to ask in an email, I've done this a variety of times, what is the audio visual setup? You can ask that in advance, ask what they have, ask if they expect you to email or give them a USB with the presentation on it so they can put it on one of their machines. Ask them if they have what type of connections, there's a meow, I told you it would happen. Uh, audio visual is, you know, they, they have their particular setup, it's okay to ask for that in advance. Bring everything you need. I'm using a wireless mouse right now just to click through a PowerPoint presentation. There are specific PowerPoint clickers you can buy. Wireless mouse are usually fine. You really just need something that can click. Obviously, make sure your laptop is fully charged before coming in. Hopefully, it's got a decent battery life, but why not top it off at 100%? Adapters. Know what audiovisual output your laptop has. Is it mini display port? Is it HDMI? Make sure that you have a converter from mini display port to HDMI or HDMI to mini display port, or even put a couple backups in there, VGA, DVI, normal size display port. It's worth it to have them because the awkward, this is the most awkward part I found of going into a publisher meeting is getting at your laptop. Everyone's kind of sitting there looking at you, possibly making some weird small talk and you're sitting there like, oh, uh, what's the input? Is it, should we do? try and minimize that as much as possible um, and everything will be a lot smoother. Also, one more note, sorry, I clicked ahead too fast. Uh, if you have a vertical slice that is even remotely demanding, it's important that your laptop be plugged in for that because GPUs have thermal throttling. If you're not plugged in, your performance will drop significantly. Obviously, you want your vertical slice or prototype to come off as wonderfully as possible. So in those cases, you're going to plug in if you're going to show them a demo. If not, go ahead and leave it unplugged. It'll save you a few seconds. All right. This cat is adorable. Toastmasters in 60 seconds. Uh, this is obviously a massive sweeping topic that you could take weeks, months, if not years to try and master public rhetoric it is a thing that's been going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years. I'm gonna try and give you a super quick lowdown in just 60 seconds, hopefully relevant to gaming pitches in particular. Um, never memorize anything precisely. This is what you see up on an E3 stage when people memorize word for word exactly what they're going to say. They come off as extremely robotic. That's why they're all stiff and awkward. You never wanna do that. Instead, what you wanna do is just know the basic points of what you wanna say and use the bullet points in your presentation just as a reminder as you go through step by step. You just see the bullet point and you're like, okay, cool. That's what I should talk about now. One thing you can do though, and it doesn't particularly matter in this setup, but you can memorize your bullet point order because cool guys don't look at explosions. And what I mean by that is, let's say I was presenting in a more normal in-person circumstance on this television behind me. And let's say my next bullet point were, you know, uh, our budget is $2.5 million. I could click and then there's an awkward second where I have to look and I'm like, and our budget is $2.5 million. Or you could just be super cool and be like, click and our budget is $2.5 million. It's a minor thing, but it does come off as like way more composed. I do recommend doing that if you have the time and you should, because you're probably practicing this for weeks or months in advance. Eye contact, this is super, super basic. Every human wants this. Eye contact is necessary. It's important to note that scientists have shown that you shouldn't be maintaining eye contact directly for more than four seconds with a single person, unless you are romantically involved with them. And I doubt that's the case in any of your pitches. You should be sweeping across the room, making eye contact with every person individually, assuming there's a normal amount of people in the room. Go from the left to the right to the left. This, I'm not gonna say this is easy. This is not a natural thing to do. You're thinking about a lot of things up here, your presentation, trying to impress them, the vertical slice, something's not working, someone's making a weird noise in the back left corner. This is something you should practice. I'll get to practice in a little bit, but it's not automatic. Keep working on that, it will make a big, big difference. Uh, reading the room. You might have a plan and every plan is great, but as Mike Tyson famously said, uh, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. 
you have to be willing to react and adjust depending on how the room is going. Is it lighthearted? Are they smiling and laughing at your jokes? Throw in some more. Don't go crazy with it. No one likes too many jokes. Are they being very serious, buttoned up, and you know, not really reacting to anything like that? Start sweeping those out, get to business, be serious about it. It's very, very important to get the energy from the people in the room and then feed that back to them. It makes people much, much, much more comfortable. Lampshade. Uh, this is something that hopefully you don't have to do, but it can be a really good icebreaker. Lampshading is a, a TV trope, if you don't know what that means. Uh, it's where you intentionally draw attention to something that you know is bad or incorrect. Uh, I went into a pitch, the one actually that got me funding earlier this year. Uh, the night prior, we had tried to get some cloth sim working on the skirt of the main character, um, but we couldn't do it in time. And as a result, her legs as she walked and ran were clipping wildly through her skirt. So they were just coming out of her skirt and possibly, and I knew that would look a little bit bad. It's not a disaster, but before the presentation even started, I was like, guys, just want you to know, this is a little bit of a disaster. Her legs do clip through her skirt a little. I'm begging you to forgive me on this, please. I know it's really, really bad. And they just laughed and we kind of played it off. And all of a sudden it was just a funny thing in the presentation that had no bearing whatsoever negatively. Uh, don't go crazy with this. If you know something's really bad, probably don't bring it up. But if it's something minor, it can be a really good way to kind of completely negate its negativity. Finally, this one, it's some people can't do it. You can kind of train on this. But if you can, memorizing names. Now, you probably know a few names going into the meeting from the email chain. Obviously, memorize those very hard in your mind. But it's likely there are going to be people in the meeting that you didn't know would be there or that you didn't know their names. You have to memorize those names to the best of your ability. It's not like at a party where you just meet someone and then you can immediately forget their name a second later. Take the half second it requires to burn it into your mind. If someone says, hey, my name is Steve. You shake your hand, you say, hey, I'm Jason. And you just take half a second to Steve. Cool. And then you move on. Uh, you can't do this successfully every time, depending on how many people are in the room. I do just want to give myself a little bit of a shout out. One time I was pitching at Sony. Uh, the guy I was with, Nick, brought me in. There were five people in the room that I'd never met before. They introduced themselves to me sequentially across the room. And then I finished the presentation and I, I basically went to all of them and I was like, uh, Steve, Angela, Tracy, Anthony, Dan, it was great meeting all of you. And they were just like blown away. They were like, what? How in the world did you do that? If you can't get all five, that's cool. But even one or two of them, it's very important to make sure that they felt seen by you as well as vice versa can't emphasize how useful that is. Moving on, practice. I didn't do as much practice for this as I probably should have. Do as I say, not as I do. Do a lot of practice. You should be doing this constantly for days and weeks, if not months, prior to your pitching experience. Obviously, pitching itself is practice. The more you do it, the better you'll get, but you wanna do that before the stakes actually matter. You should always be practicing with a full length body mirror, no exceptions. If you're practicing without a full length body mirror, you're not getting nearly as much use out of it. You need to see not only what you're saying and hear yourself say it, but you need to see yourself. How's your posture? Are you correctly sweeping back and forth? How are your hand gestures? All of these things matter and they're not normal human things to think about. Everything is awkward. Pockets are nice, but maybe like don't put your hand in your pocket. It's better to gesture with them. Being in front of a mirror lets you see that and work on that. It's very, very important. My next tip is a little bit weird. Um, hopefully you guys have available friends. I know the pandemic is making this difficult. And maybe if you're lucky, you even have some actor friends. Here's what I recommend. Ask them, you know, buy them pizza. Say, hey, can I come over, practice my pitch on you guys? And don't let them be a kind, attentive audience. What you should be directing them to do, which is hopefully fun for them, are to be huge, massive assholes the entire time. During the pitch, they should be coughing wildly, one's down on their phone, maybe even one picks up a fake phone call in the middle of your presentation. They'll interrupt you with rude questions. They'll do the worst possible things so that you can be prepared for when those things happen in real pitches. And yes, they actually happen in real pitches. During the question and answer section, have them ask awful, insulting questions, things like, why in the world would anyone buy this? Or you expect us to invest in this? This genre is dead. Whatever. They can make up whatever they want. This inherently makes every other real pitch seem easier by comparison. And believe it or not, I have actually dealt with a few of those horrible questions myself. Uh, it's probably not going great if you get those questions, but if you do, at least you'll be prepared 
Also, it's kind of fun. I don't know. I highly suggest practicing in front of a live audience. If they're not uh, you know, mean, at least they're still there. It's important to get that experience too. Please practice. It's very, very important. Moving on, follow-up material. You can pitch, but you have to get them that stuff somehow. If we're living in the past, maybe we used, I mean, CDs way in the back, way in the past, but USB keys was kind of the de facto standard for a while. Uh, you would just kind of be like, hey, I've prepared this, and you would give it to them, and that's super nice. Um, but we can do better than that. Uh, it's 2020, and we live in the future, even if the future isn't uh, everything we hoped originally. Um, there is a feature that Gmail has. It is a scheduled email uh, scheduled send, I believe it's called. You can see a little picture. It's on the bottom left. If you click the arrow next to the send feature in Gmail, here's what I recommend. Uh, know your start time for your pitch, 11 a.m. Maybe expect it goes five to 10 minutes late. That's very typical. And then knowing how long your pitch is because you've practiced it, schedule your email to send at approximately the ending point of your actual pitch presentation, not for question and answers, but pitch presentation. Basically, what this means is that approximately when you finish, an email will instantly magically pop up in their inbox. This, again, in the pitch meeting that got me funding earlier this year, it, it was timed very, very well. I finished, and then one of the people looked up and said, how did you just send us an email? And then I was just like, I'm very well prepared. And then they just smiled. Uh, it kind of feels like magic, even though this is a very simple trick. Uh, I recommend doing this. It's very cool. Uh, women. So uh, the world is bad. And uh, obviously there are a bunch of wonderful, both venture capitalists and publishers out there that will in no way uh, disadvantage you because you're a woman, but uh, this is reality. And unfortunately some people uh, are, you will be at a disadvantage and that sucks. Uh, I cannot specifically give you advice here, obviously, because I have not lived that experience. But what I did do, I actually went out to a few trusted friends, entrepreneurs, uh, women, of mine, I asked them the question, what would you in particular say is valuable to you as a woman going into these sorts of pitches? Uh, I'm going to break my own rule of not reading directly from bullet points here because I'm directly reading their quotes for you. Um, one said, I'm not sure if this is good advice for this, but I've been given advice to apply slash speak slash do things with the confidence of a mediocre white man like this. Uh, most women undervalue, undersell themselves. Most men oversell. This is absolutely true. It's kind of the way we've all been raised, at least men like me. Uh, do not undervalue yourself. Don't undersell yourself. Uh, you're worth it. I asked another. She said, a big one for me is learning to use stronger language, dress a bit more stylish. Don't let yourself be talked over. I've seen that so many times. Uh, and don't be afraid to admit you don't know something. And my number one piece of advice is to not be afraid to sell yourself. Remember, you are the product here and you're absolutely worth it. Let them know that as well. Um, that's what they said. I thought they include that because it sucks. The, this sort of advice also somewhat applies to minorities and other people of color as well. Um, just there's a little bit of an extra hurdle sometimes and it sucks. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. It's really bad. Um, that is pretty much the end of this presentation. Questions are a thing that you guys can do now. Uh, if you want, I can also talk a little bit more about my own experience pitching. Um, but yeah. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nathan. So let, let's start there. I mean, we've got a couple of questions coming in, but go through some of the experiences that, that you've had, what went well, what didn't, and we can use that as a, as a kicking off point. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I can't go into too much detail about the specific game I was making, but I will say that there's kind of two ways you can go generally uh, with a game pitch. One is the tried and true method where you are taking an established genre, an established piece, and then you can directly compare that. Like, for instance, as a huge example, you could be like, well, have you guys played Fall Guys? OK, this is like Fall Guys, but with guns. And then, you know, investors are like, okay, fall guys with guns. That's a free idea. You guys can take that. I'm not going to do it. Um, and then there's the other type of idea, which was sort of my idea, which is like an off the wall, wild, uh, artsy, almost art house type of thing. It's, it's I don't want to call it experimental, but it's probably on the avant-garde side of things. And when these, with these two things, you have very divergent approaches, I feel. And it, it really determines actually uh, not only a little bit how you pitch, because I ended up, and you could probably see from my personality, are a little bit quirkier than maybe a lot of presenters, um, but it affects mainly who you go to. 
venture capitalists, in my experience with the avant-garde stuff, they're not as interested in that. They're more interested in the potential home run, the fun 10 projects hoping one blows up. That's the fall guys with guns approach. For me, venture capital was a little bit tougher. So I went after publishers as a result. This was the game I always wanted to make. Now there, it's, it's strange because I feel that in venture capital, I don't want to say there's unlimited opportunities, but there's enough potential investors in the world that you could essentially continuously pitch, not for, you know, like indefinitely. With publishers, there are a very finite number of publishers. A few new ones spring into existence every few years, but generally you've got, you know, Devolver Digital and Raw Fury and Kelly Knights and Annapurna Interactive and, you know, Sega and Atlas and, you know, Microsoft and Sony fund a lot of projects directly. Uh, Google does some stuff with Stadia, though that's not as hot these days. Um, Oculus, I mean, I could name some stuff, but there's like a set number and you can go to those and when they say no, they're crossed off the list and your list gets smaller. And that was the sense I was getting, I think, as I pitched this game over and over. It felt a little bit uh, more difficult for me as I was kind of seeing the list dwindle. But the good news is that assuming you didn't make a fool of yourself and you were very kind, those people, hopefully even if they said no, you'll be on their chains, you'll be able to communicate with them in the future. I had a game or two that completely struck out. I went to every single person I could think of and no one said yes. That's okay. I mean, maybe you invested some dollars in the vertical slice or prototype production. That sucks that you lost that money, but eventually you can always retool and pivot and try something new. And it was on my third attempt, I believe was this game. I went to a publisher who I had been to before for another game that they said no to. But again, I reached out, they were like, oh, we'd love to have you in again. It's very, very important to accept. This is something I didn't mention. Please accept a no with grace. Always accept it with grace. Even if they were kind of mean to you, maybe their management will change. Maybe a new person will come in as business development. There's always some reason never burn a bridge. I mean, unless they do something truly heinous to you, then burn a bridge, I guess, but try not to. Um, and it was one of these that I went in, it was January. I had pitched this particular game I want to say 20 to 25 times. And that is brutal. That's emotionally rough. I mean, prepare for that. I mean, you know, laying awake at night and wondering if anyone's ever going to bite on this idea. Like it sucks. It really does. Like, I guess this is the life we've chosen. So, you know, self inflicted pain, I guess, to some extent, but you know, every success that I've heard of comes after a wild, insanely long string of failures. When I went in to you know, this publisher meeting in January, um, I was confident I had a fully working vertical slice. I'm sure you guys have maybe talked about this. It depends on who you are, but with a publisher these days, you really wanna have at the very least a working prototype and even better than that, if you can get some art in there, a working vertical slice as well. Um, I'm also not sure if everyone knows exactly what a vertical slice is. I don't know, should I explain that? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, vertical slice comes from the idea of a cake, like you have a whole cake, but if you took a vertical slice of the cake, it still represents the whole cake. You still get a sense of how delicious the cake is. It's just not the whole thing. A vertical slice is meant to be a five to 10 to 15, whatever minute section of your game that of course is incomplete, but it has art that might resemble the final art. It has sound that might resemble the final sound. It's meant to be representative of what your entire cake will be. That's much less risky for publishers and venture capitalists to see. A prototype can be promising, but invariably most prototypes I've seen are made of gray cubes and default assets that give them no idea about what this game is going to look like. And as much as it maybe we wish it weren't the case, art sells. If your game does not look good, not a lot of people are going to look at it. So it's important for them to see that. Now that takes investment. You probably don't have a huge team of artists at your beck and call and disposal. Um, you might need to go freelance. You might need to call up some friends you've worked with in the past. You can contract people from other companies if they have some time. I know I have a, another company here in Los Angeles that, you know, I've been able to just sort of like rent out their employees for a little bit. It's kind of like an art outsourcing thing. Um, use every connection you have scrap. I, that's, that's sort of a scrappy thing. If you want to try and get your vertical slice in on the cheap. Um, I think my vertical slice ended up costing me. You know, supposed to drop numbers, I'll drop number 30, I mean, it's like $30,000, $35,000, which is not chump change. I mean, I have had some successful games in the past, but like that's basically my personal money since I own the business. It's like, it's mentally hard to invest that, but um, 
you know, but there are ways, again, if that was a full 3D experience in Unreal, you might have, you know, a 2D pitch or a visual novel pitch or something much simpler and cheaper to produce. I don't want to say that that's some kind of number that you should expect to spend. Um, obviously, it can range very widely there. Anyway, uh, I went into this publisher meeting with the vertical slice. Things went off very well. I got in. There was a good energy in there. They were happy to see me. They were, uh, you know, commenting on the last time I came in. I told them I was on The Floor is Lava, which is a Netflix show. I'm on episode six. Just like some dumb nonsense to like break the ice and get them friendly. Um, and you can kind of sense how these things are going, I think, when you're in there. You can kind of ramp up the energy uh, and really kind of feed off of that. Um, and it just, I remember walking out, I have 10 people were in that pitch. I walked out, one of them sent me an email within two minutes saying that was awesome. Like within, I walked out and I checked my phone and it was there. Uh, that was a pretty good sign. Uh, and they told me they would let me know within a month or two. And then the next like day I was driving on the 405 in Los Angeles and I got the email and nearly crashed. Uh, <laughs> it was, that was a crazy day. Um, but yeah, that was, I don't know the, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely curious to take questions specifically from people about what they're curious on. It's hard for me to focus in on specific elements uh without prompting but yeah that was that was what happened. Right. We, we've got a couple of them lined up here so from the discord if you've got you know five minutes to present a pitch deck what's the best way to ensure you won't run out of time which slide should you focus on and what point should you make well i want to quickly point out that it's you know th there are very specific events set up that say we're going to have a pitch in five minutes i've seen like kind of conferences and almost like hackathon type events where they go all right we're, we're doing pitches one every five minutes if you're going into a pitch that you organized yourself you're going into a business even if they say five minutes you can probably go over and like what are they going to do kick you out of the room that said if you do indeed have a very strict five minutes that is something you should apps that's that's 100 practice you need to go in front of a mirror start a stopwatch, do your presentation, and do it five times in a row without going over, period. It's possible they might interrupt you, but if it's a five minute format, they're probably not going to. I would leave yourself approximately 15 seconds of buffer time there. Also note that when you are nervous, this is a totally normal human thing, people tend to speed up. You tend to go through your points quicker, you tend to like burn through your words because you just wanna get through it. Um, so it's unlikely in that case that if you practice the five minutes that you'll actually exceed it and go slower in the presentation. Kind of unrelated, that is also something you should work on when you're practicing. Make sure your words are clear, slow enough, it makes you seem calm and in control. I do tend to speak a little bit faster than most people, um, but it's still with a measured cadence and it's still making sure that everyone can understand. Other than that, uh, make sure that you don't spend too much time on your own introductions. Keep those streamlined. I mean, they want to know who you are, but invariably, if you only have five minutes, it's most important to focus on the meat of the deck, the things that you've spent time preparing. Um, and always be sure to thank people at the end. I know, again, that's kind of a dumb, simple thing, but again, people do forget it. Uh, it's very important to express appreciation. And remember, those types of tiny things might get you in the door again with them later for another pitch. So, Another one from the Discord. I know you're not supposed to read directly from the slides, but what do publishers most care most about in these presentations? Um, ultimately, I think they care about, the, I mean, the slides, clearly my slides here are, are blank, but the point of that is because the slides are mainly there for visual reference. They are there for concept art. They are there for graphs and figures. They are there for video of your game or audio that you've made in your vertical slice. They're meant to be an aid to you, not things that you directly read off of. As far as the more general question of what is a publisher looking for, it really does depend. A lot are gonna be much more business focused. They wanna see your ROI, they wanna see your demographic, they wanna see your uh, sales projections, they wanna see comparisons to past games that are relatively similar and possible sales data that you have from those. Do a little bit of research on the publisher. You can pretty easily, like, make, you know, it's not going to be online what they care about. But if you have any friends that have talked to them before, you can kind of see their lineup and their production, what type of games they've made. You can kind of tailor your pitches individually to each publisher. Others, the one that I went to, I mentioned that I had kind of a weird avant-garde game. Those people wanted to see the visuals. That's what they were concerned about. I think initially we had talked about the game and they liked the idea. They liked the gameplay. They liked the core game loop. But in, you know, at least in my particular case, I didn't have a particular history of making games that were beautiful. I've done a couple of games, you could look them up before the Echo and there came an Echo. 
Their Cayman Echo looks cool, but it's an isometric game. It's partially 2D, partially 3D. Everything's pretty far zoomed out. Um, so what I was asking and what they were questioning was, can you make this game beautiful? So the thing that they were most concerned about, and I knew this going in, was the art. And I made sure to center my slides and my presentation around showing them what I and my team were able to do making that vertical slice. Um, I don't think there's any hard and fast answer to what do they care about the most. Um, but remember, like, that's kind of a pitch deck question in some sense. Um, no matter what's up there, no matter how you've decided to structure it, in the end, you're still selling you alongside the product. So it's really, really important not reading off those bullet points, not seeming like a weird robot who's sweating through all their layers and freaking out. Um, just try and be as comfortable as possible. And also, if I may, real quick, this is a piece of life advice, not just a piece of pitch advice. And it doesn't make sense during the pandemic. If you can ever take an improvisational comedy class, and that's such an accurate thing to say, please do so even if you're not an actor. The idea of improvisational comedy sounds terrifying and it kind of is at first, but learning those concepts about how to deal with character, how to yes and people, how to work with them in a scene, you'd be surprised how unbelievably useful those concepts are applied to presentations, applied to normal conversations in real life. That's a long-term investment, maybe not super great right now, uh, but if you can, go take an improv class. So uh, Real Mr. Yon from Twitch says, how much of your product was done before you pitched it? Good question. Um, obviously, the more, the better. Obviously, you know, in, in my particular case, so there's two deals you can go with a publisher. One is your game is mostly done or at least halfway done. And what you're asking from the publisher is basically like, hey, I'm going to give you a percent, often 20, often 30, to do all that publisher stuff, marketing, QA, localization. Uh, submission to various platforms and dealing with the QA associated with, you know, PlayStation and Xbox. Um, in those cases, you kind of obviously have to have the game mostly done. They might kick in some funds for you at the end to help finish things up, but it's not that common. The percentage is much lower. On the other hand, what I was doing was basically asking for full funding or at least like 90, 80, 90% funding in exchange for a much higher percentage, of course, that they reap on the back end since they generally funded the project. Um, in that case, the, I mean, obviously the more the better, but because it's a larger project, you can't be expected to fund that much. I did mention that I had spent 30, 35,000 on a vertical slice, but from a functional perspective, I've mentioned the game was a JRPG. What you would expect from that particular genre is that you see how the battle system works and functions, and that you at least have some basic art showing a character walking around an environment. That, isn't a lot from the perspective of the percentage of the complete game once it's done, but the battle system is kind of the core of that experience and they wanted to see it. And who wouldn't? If you're making a game, if you're making a shooter, you want to see how the gameplay, how shooting a gun and killing someone feels. That's very important. If you're making a fighting game, you would expect to have at least two characters going off in a side by side. Uh, showing off the basic functionality of the game is important. Don't get bogged down in the details. Don't make a start screen. Don't have a pause menu. You don't need to do any of that stuff. You just need to demonstrate the core. Now, again, you can go into pitch meetings with a prototype, not a vertical slice. That's okay. It depends on who you're pitching to, what budget you're asking for, and a variety of other factors. But I have seen successful game pitches that came just from a prototype. Super hot, famously, it's a really popular VR game in the Oculus, came from a game jam. I think they did that in either 24 or 48 hours. And part of the art style of that game came from the fact that they had so little time. It's mainly just red characters in a white boxy environment. Um, you, you can get away with that stuff. But again, if you're asking for a lot of money, you generally have to go a little farther. So now they're pouring in. So yeah, let's go. Are there, are there differences between pitching to publishers versus investors? Yes. I mean, absolutely. Um, Obviously, at the at the basic fundamental level, um, venture capitalists and investors obviously want some amount of your company. That's the general deal. Um, they're very concerned about, you know, monetary figures, ROI. Uh, they want to see past comparisons. Um, publishers very rarely. It, it's happened. Uh, I, I think I talked to Nexon once, and they were interested in like partial investing. Uh, but generally, publishers have a game per game basis. So. Uh, the particular deal I worked out without getting into specifics is for the game that they are funding and that I am releasing. They are taking us a, a very large percentage of the revenue of that game 
but they own nothing of my company itself, and it only lasts for that game, with the exception of any possibly developed sequels in the future and related IP. If there were, I mean, this is wildly ambitious, but if there was a television show or a movie uh, made about this, I also have right of first refusal on the sequel, so I get to develop it unless I say no, basically. Then they could take it to another developer. I wouldn't say no. Of course, I would love to make a sequel to my own game. That mean, that would mean it was successful. Um, again, for me, it always I, I've always kind of had a a thing about owning my own company. You know, I just I've always I always wanted to own it 100 percent That's not to say I wouldn't take a great deal if one came along. Um, I've been offered a few. Um, but I don't. I didn't think they were good enough at the time uh, to really justify it. That said, everyone has different goals. Um, trust me, I would absolutely sell out for the right price. Um, and again, I think I mentioned this earlier. Just the the vibe of those meetings tend to, tends to be different. You're dealing with the business world, and yes, publishing is obviously a business, and obviously they have to be very competent at what they do to be successful. But ultimately, I think people get into video game publishing specifically because they love games, and they're you know that it's a it's a little bit more of a creative feel in those rooms. Uh, personally, I'm just a little bit more comfortable in those environments, but most of the things I've said today are applicable for either type. So we got a, a good one here from, from Greech on Twitch. Sending pitch decks to an email address on VC website seems like a black hole. How do you get warm intros to the investors that you know play in your space? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a thing, right? That's, that's the, that's the trick. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a cop out to say networking in some ex, in some some extent, especially today. That's that's very very difficult. Um, I will say that you need a seed crystal, as I've always put it. I felt like I need this with normal friends too. But there's one person who you've met, probably, who is bizarrely well connected, and who can introduce you to three people, and then one or two of those people can introduce you to three more people. And it's hard to find that person. You, they have to like you. You have to seem like you're not just grabbing onto them because they're useful to you. They have to be a real friend. Um, for me, it was a guy named Ben Kutcher and I was lucky enough to meet him at GDC one year. Um, he reached out to me because I had done something with Intel and he was working at Intel at the time, even though he was leaving soon. He just wanted to get lunch. And very quickly I identified that this dude like knew everybody. And as someone who was, this was 2013, as someone who was relatively younger, who had come from Florida where there is no game development community, who had only been to E3 and GDC a handful of times, I didn't really know anyone. I didn't have the connections that I needed. And, you know, in some sense, there, there are very many ways you could, you could do this. If you work in AAA or work at a larger company for a few years, those connections are invaluable. Uh, if you go to networking or mixer events in your area, whether it's Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, any major game development community, you're going to be able to meet those people. Networking is a whole separate talk um, that that someone could give. Uh, you have to, you know, when you go to those, I think originally I actually had a bullet point in this presentation that I ended up taking out because it was slightly problematic, but it was like, can you get them drunk? Which isn't to say that you should go and try and just pour alcohol down their throat, but being able to talk to any of these people that are in these positions outside of a traditional weird pitch conference room, which is always, it's just a weird thing that humans do. Getting to meet them in a bar or somewhere, a more casual environment where you can just sit down and just have a genuine conversation with them as opposed to this weird transactional thing that's going on is incredibly invaluable. And again, always assume, always assume that everyone will be useful, even if it's not now or in six months or a year, in five years, maybe that person will be in a position. I maintained a relationship, a relationship with uh, this random friend from college who loved games with me. And now he's that he just got hired as like a third party developer relations at Nintendo. And it's not weird for me to just suddenly hit him up because I've been talking to him this whole time. Um, if, you know, it's always weird to just randomly hit someone up after like five years and be like, hey, can you do this thing for me? Um, it's work to maintain those relationships. It is draining to maintain those relationships. But it's, I, I like to think of meeting people as scratch tickets. Um, you buy scratch tickets, most of them aren't gonna work out, but the more you buy, the more people you meet, eventually the better your odds that you're gonna be able to scratch off a $100 winner. I don't know, don't buy scratch tickets. The lottery's a mathematical scam, but you get my point. Uh, just keep going out and meeting people. Again, the pandemic makes this super hard to do, um, but that's, that's, that's the trick. It's just human, human contact and relation and, Networking is the whole thing, but yeah. 
So, I mean, here's the question that comes up on, you know, especially where I am, because I'm over on the East Coast. And, yeah. you know, you're in L.A. There's obviously a lot of investors, you know, up the road from you in San Francisco. Yeah. How does all this change when you're in an area, you know, on like basically the entire East Coast outside of New York that you don't have that yeah. ingrained investor community? Well, um, yeah, Boston and New York are the only like kind of halfway options there. In some sense, you know, I'm never going to say the pandemic's good. It's not good. Um we're kind of a little bit all on an equal playing field now, because even if an investor is sort of down the street, most people are uncomfortable with me just going into their office and pitching. Um, being able to do that stuff virtually is tough, but doable. Now, it's it's always better. And the reason I gave a presentation about sweeping across the audience with your eyes is that meeting you in person is invaluable. I'll never think that goes away. No matter how virtual we move, pitching will always be better done in person. But ultimately, Plane tickets are expensive, you know, and if you spent $400 just to take a round trip to San Francisco to pitch, well, you're, like I said, you're probably going to fail 20 times before you get a success, if not more, probably way more. So like, unless you're super well off, that's probably not worth it for you. Um, how does it change? I mean, you, you have to find a way to, you know, I would say this, I would say, pick your battles with those plane tickets. What you should be doing is, reaching out to as many people as you can and getting as far along in that process as you can with every person. And you have to identify, do I think this person is a, is a higher likelihood than all the others? Obviously no pitch is a high likelihood. That's insane. You might get 30% at best for any individual pitch. But if you know that one company feels like a really good fit to you, you've had a few conversations with them, whether via email or Skype, or maybe you hit them up in the past before the pandemic started, I don't know. And you can reach out to them virtually in any capacity. Every time you reach out to them virtually, you will get more of an idea about whether or not you think they're genuinely interested and that you have a genuine shot with those people. If you do think that, it might be worth the investment to take a trip out there. If not, it's still probably worth saying, hey, listen, I know, you know we've just been talking. I'd love to just get five or 10 minutes of your time and show you what I and my team have been working on. We think it's a really, really excellent investment for you. What do you say? If they say no, then, all right, they probably weren't gonna say yes to you eventually anyway, but it, you know, be direct. I, I find that, again, pitching being one of the weirdest kind of things a human being can do, uh, lampshading it, which I mentioned earlier, like just drawing attention to how awkward it is and kind of ignoring it may just be the best way to go. Just directly tell them that you're interested in pitching with them, that you're directly interested in working with them. Don't play this weird, you know, wandering game. If you like the girl, just tell her you like her and see how it goes. Same sort of thing here. Um, being afraid of rejection is a real thing and no one's completely over that. I'm not completely over that, but you got to do it, especially if you don't have the opportunity, the, the more uh, myriad opportunities and maybe being in those physical spaces. So two of them that, that are tied here together. Uh, if you're very anxious before the presentation, are there some ways that help to help calm yourself down? Yeah, no, for sure. That's a big one, especially when like, you know, like I was just saying, if you know that this is a really good chance you know, no matter how practiced you are, you end up getting nervous. First of all, avoid the caffeine. You're not going to need the energy boost. You're super nervous. You've probably got adrenaline running through your brains do, or your, your veins. Do not drink caffeine or anything like that. No nootropics or mind enhancing drugs. Those are all generally not scientifically proved nonsense. Mushrooms. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't do it. I mean, I have had some people actually tell me that they smoke weed beforehand. I, I do not recommend it. If you've seen me remotely like a student, don't do it. Um, but you might be super, super nervous before the presentation. Um, these are times that I would turn to uh, some things I'm probably not super qualified to talk about. For instance, uh, meditation, yoga, breathing exercises, things like this. Um, I can talk about emotionally, what's the phrase? Uh, high hopes, low expectations, or is it vice versa? Um, you, you need to understand that the vast majority of these pitches are just not going to work out. They're not, and it it sucks. But like, don't 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 be self defeating. Don't don't walk in thinking I'm not going to get this. But just mentally take a step back and say, listen, this is all I can do. All I can do is go in there, present my game, and see how it goes. If you go in and it doesn't work out, maybe then there's some steps you can take to improve your pitch, to improve your delivery, to do better the next time. But when you're right before the presentation, 
it's all pretty much locked in. You can't make last minute changes to your code base. You can't make last minute changes to your PowerPoint slide. You've done the work. It's time to just go in. And knowing that ultimately how you do in this particular presentation probably won't matter to me is a little bit freeing. It's a little bit just makes you a little looser, makes you a little bit more comfortable. People can sense that. People can sense when you're up here just from your body language, if you're like stiff and you're, you're nervous, maybe there's some beads of sweat gathering on there. Um, it's totally natural to be nervous. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The more you do, hopefully, the less that goes. But breathing exercises and meditation, despite seeming like sometimes weird hokey Eastern stuff, scientifically proven to absolutely work. Bring down that blood pressure, bring down your heart rate. Uh, I, I, I mean, breathing exercises, I mean, you can just get an app on your phone that kind of guides you through a little bit of that. Makes me feel a lot better. I don't know. Everyone kind of has their own thing there. So, so what do you do if your mind goes blank during the presentation? What's the best way to recover? I mean, I'm all about lampshading. If my mind goes blank, just be like, <laughs> hold on one sec. Uh, right. Like, j don't, uh, there's a thing in chess where if you blunder once, if you make a mistake, it ten or uh, let's, let's, no chess metaphor, a football metaphor might be better. Uh, when a quarterback throws an interception, the best quarter, everyone throws interceptions. Aaron Rodgers throws interceptions. Tom Brady throws interceptions. Well, he's old now, but whatever. Um, the best quarterbacks just go out the next series and start throwing balls again. The, the worst quarterbacks throw an interception and then it gets in their head and now they're, they're second guessing themselves. They're not doing their check downs and they're throwing more interceptions. Everyone throws interceptions. Everyone makes bad moves in chess. The important thing is how you recover from that. If you have a bad moment in a presentation, that's okay. You can still win the gold medal in figure skating if you fall, but you can't fall again. You can't fall multiple times. Get up, continue on as if, as if nothing had happened, or again, make a little joke about it in a lampshade. From a practical perspective, that's kind of why you have the bullet points there, because they're the guides for you. There, you can always look back at your bullet points, you know, basically look down at your index cards and see where you were and just reorient, rebring yourself back into that space. Um, and hopefully you can use that. During the question and answer section like this, you don't necessarily have that crutch. I don't have bullet points that I'm reading for you right now. Um, that'll come with practice. I think if I were to have a blank spot right here, just to, like earlier, my cat meowed. That was a little weird. I sort of just laughed it off, and and I think she, I think he was sitting here for like ten minutes of the presentation. Um, that's I want to say that's where the improv can kind of help out. Like I feel like the skills gained in improv can really help you with the, deal with those sorts of interruptions, but. Uh, practice again makes perfect there. It, it's all right. Uh, my dog constantly snores during the podcast. I don't know if it's, you know, because we're boring her or if it's like time of day. You know, but she's, uh, he's getting a presentation. I'm going to snore right now. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Yeah. Um, all right. So Nightwolf says for horror game pitches, what's more important yeah. after the setting and the story, visuals or audio? Ooh, great question. Here's the thing. Both are incredibly important, obviously. Any great horror game excels in both of those things. However, due to the logistics of the pitching environment, it can be difficult to get the proper audio environment that you want them to be in. You can bring really nice headphones with you, but even then, think about how that would work logistically. You're in a room, probably with more than one person, and you have to say like, oh, uh, Kelly, come here real quick. You, you, you gotta listen to this. And then she's like, uh, okay. And then she like puts on headphones, and then everyone is awkwardly watching her as she, sit there, as she sits there hearing something that only she can hear. And then she's done and she's like, oh, cool. Oh, Jerry, you gotta check this out. It gets very, very awkward. It's not that audio isn't important. Remember, you're sending up following, or you're sending follow-up material to this. Hopefully that can demonstrate the fidelity of both of those things. But when you're actually pitching in the environment, it's easy to see on a big screen. Hopefully you've connected to one of their TVs. Mine, my laptop's too far. Um, but they can just directly see the visuals. And I think that unfortunately from a marketing perspective, I know how important audio is, uh, but when you're, when you're marketing a, a horror game or really any game, audio generally isn't the first thing that people think of unless it's like a rhythm game. I think people are inherently drawn to the visuals, to making, to making sure that this feels like a really quality product here. Um, I personally would, would err on the visuals just for the pitch during the game. Make that audio great. Positional, 3D, use a head transfer response function, whatever. Uh, but I just think for the pitching visuals, probably easier to convey. All right. I got a quick question. Are you okay going a few minutes late? No problem. Okay. Because um, we got questions coming in here and you're the last speaker. So we're good to go. All right. No.
Uh, next one from Discord. How much did you talk about the actual game versus the team and the budget? Oh, good question. Uh, it's a little bit more of a pitch question, but happy to answer. Um, I think it depends on who you are. I think if you have a well-established team that can that together as a general unit has made a past game, that's something because like think about it from a publisher's perspective. Every game that comes in, every pitch that comes in is risk. They're taking on the risk and they're trying to analyze if it's worth it for them to make that gamble on you. If you have a team that has put out together a quality game in the past, oh my God, lean on that. Lean on its Metacritic score, lean on its sales, lean on its visuals, whatever is good about that product because that is the most risk reduction possible thing that you can show with the team. Of course, the game is important, don't neglect that. But a lot of us, I assume, including me, are coming from a background that you didn't really have the team assembled and that you had some individuals who had worked on some stuff in the past, like my composer had worked on Call of Duty too. Great, and, and uh, a designer had worked on Mass Effect. Oh, that's super cool, that helps, but ultimately, it's just kind of a little feather in the cap, not really a core thing. In those situations, which I assume most of you are in, you want to lean on the game and not just the design and the visuals, also its specifics, like its ROI and its, you know, and its data and its everything like that. Um, but that's ultimately what you really want to bring to the forefront because you're like, hey, listen, I know I'm small. I know I don't have a huge team that's made a big game. Don't say that, but you know, it's what's implied. Um, but look at this. Do you believe in this idea? Can you imagine people going crazy over this when it comes out on PlayStation or Steam or whatever? That's ultimately when you're smaller, what you're trying to get them to bite on. Now they're also you're also getting them to try and bite on you, but your present you're presenting yourself will come through as you talk about your game. Here's a quick tip that I haven't talked about. If you do not sound passionate when you're talking about your own game, they're not gonna fund you straight up. If you can't get passionate about your own project, you should be the biggest evangelist of your product. You should put a smile on your face with your own face. When you're talking about it, you should just like get this, I don't want to say manic energy because that's weird, but you should be hyped about your own game because if you're not, why should they be? And that can take some practice because remember, you're up there, you're nervous, you're trying to consider all these factors and the presentation and the question and answers and all this weird stuff, but you have to remember be excited about your game because it's probably super cool. Be excited. And it's hard to do. Like you said, after you've done this for 20 or 30 times and nobody's bought it, that gets yeah. harder and harder and harder. Oh, yeah. Um, it, yeah, for sure. All right. So uh, while you're on vertical slices, I'm going to start jumping around with these questions, which means inevitably I'm going to screw something up, but we're going to go with it anyway. Yeah. Vertical slices are supposed to show final quality before most of the trials and errors, tests, and improvements. Should they mm. be considered as an investment to seduce the investors or publishers rather than the actual final game? Yeah, yeah, yes. That, the answer is unequivocally yes. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Your vertical slice will, in the end, differ significantly from the final product. They know that. There's no way you can go through a year plus of development and just stick exactly to this random thing you made for pitches. Um, it's primarily made to, you, you're, you're selling a vision with a vertical slice. You're like, listen, just like a dream, the specifics might not be perfect. You might not remember the details, but do you remember the feeling of having that dream, whether it was terror or joy or glory? That's the emotional impact you want to distill into them with whatever you've got. You can do that with visuals, with sound, with gameplay, with writing. But ultimately, what you're doing is using the vertical slice as a vehicle to sell them the idea of your game. Do not worry about, like, no reasonable investor or publisher is going to expect you to completely adhere to what you showed them in the pitch. And frankly, if they did, I'd be concerned. I'd be like, you never, you, you didn't think any of this was worth changing or adjusting over the year and a half that you had to make this or whatever. Uh, to me, I, I'd be like, that's bizarre. I, that's what I would think. Um, yeah. Fair enough. All right, we're going to stay on uh, vertical slices for a second. Uh, oh, how common is it to showcase the vertical slice? Do you play it for them in real time? Let them play it, play a video. And then I'm going to segue that into even more. What's the best way to present it? Do you set up floor space as you have right now? Or is it best to sit in a chair and go at it, even if you can't be as expressive? Well, good question. There's a couple of things. One, 
you know your vertical slice better than anybody. And some vertical slices are robust. Others, you know, you, there's no tutorial usually in a vertical slice. I mean, you, you can bake one in. It's a little bit of extra work. I, most vertical slices I've seen do not have tutorials. If you think, A, that it's confusing enough that they're not going to get it, or B, that uh, there's the possibility of bugs happening if they do a certain thing or they can like go off the edge of the map because you didn't put in collision detection for that stuff, it's best for you to demo it directly or to just play a video. Video is the safest thing you can do, and frankly, it would not be a bad idea just in case something goes wrong with a vertical slice, code is scary and sometimes it breaks, to just have a recorded video uh, on your, your laptop, just in case things go poorly, be like, you know what, I've actually taken some rendering footage of this, uh, let me go ahead and play it for you. And then it's on the screen. That said, um, it does depend on the publisher. I have seen some people who were very excited to get their hands on the vertical slice because they believe that watching a game is different from playing a game. Frankly, I agree. If I were a publisher, I would want the controller in my hands. But other publishers, I've noticed, don't really seem to want that. So what I would suggest is, if you're confident in one of them playing the game, like you can guide them, you can you can say like, oh, well here, you, you know, you can go over to the left, whatever, um, but always ask them, always say, would you prefer um, to, to play the vertical slice or, you know, do you want, I can I can take care of it, no problem. Um, and they'll just give you an answer. I've, I've probably got 50-50 on that question. Um, some people really wanna play it, that's great. If you're confident in it, other people let you do it. It's a little better, I think, if you do it because you know exactly how to maybe best demonstrate the game, but ultimately a lot of publishers do really feel strongly about playing it themselves. But it's never a bad idea to have that backup just in case things go wrong. So, uh, la, 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 la. oh, sorry, I didn't answer that whole question. Um, yeah, you can, you know, I found that uh, you can take a seat during that section because, you know, while you're presenting, you're standing up, you're kind of what everyone's looking at. When they're looking at the screen, you can go ahead and either stand off to the side or you can take a seat. You don't need to be standing there right next to the screen. It's kind of distracting. So how many casual conversations should you have before having an official business conversation? <laughs> uh, is there a difference? Um, every casual conversation. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you're soft networking with somebody, if you're at a party, um, don't wait. To, if they're clear, like if you're at a business mixer, <laughs> and they're clearly an investor, you wouldn't want to like weirdly have a bunch of conversations where you talk about going bowling and then only four conversations later start to talk about business. Like, it depends on the environment. If you're at a, a networking mixer, bring it up. Talk about your game, talk about you, sell yourself. I'm sure they're there to do the same thing and that's totally not awkward. Uh, if it's someone that you were introduced to at a more casual event or if it was a virtual introduction or if it was like a friend of a friend, those types of things, you can just sort of build up a rapport with that person uh, for a little bit. There's no hard number. I think it's just when you feel like it wouldn't be awkward for you to ask and talk about maybe pitching in general to that company or just start start with an exploratory question. Be like, like, oh, like, do you guys do you guys take pitches? You know, like just a really sort of uh, it's, it's like the are you single question. Um, and then, you know, they might be like, nah, we're, you know, we're full up right now. And that's like, all right, cool. Don't press it. Just just be their friend. It's fine. Whatever. It's, you know, it might be useful later down the line. If they say something like, yeah, we, we take pitches and you're like, well, um, I don't know if you guys are interested, but uh, I do have to say I have a really interesting project my and my team have been working on. Um, would it be possible to maybe come in sometime and, and give you a look? And then they'll be like, yeah, no, whatever. We'll set it up. You know, I don't know. It's It's all contextual in that case. So uh, from the Discord again, how long does a publisher pitch usually last? Oh, good question. Um, it sort of depends on you. Oftentimes when they schedule it, they will schedule it for an hour, kind of like this talk was. Oftentimes it goes over, oftentimes it goes under. Um, I am a fan of shorter pitches in general. I don't like rambling on a long time. You can see here my PowerPoint presentation was very bare bones. Uh, most of it's coming after the fact. I don't think... Depends if you have a vertical slice, that, that doesn't matter. If it's just, we're just talking the pitch itself, PowerPoint on the TV behind you, I don't think that should last more than 15 minutes. If you have a vertical slice, I don't think that should last more than 10, um, which means that I think your maximum at that point is 25 minutes. Question and answers if they're a good venture capitalist, investor or publisher will take a significant period of time. They have significant questions, they want them addressed. Definitely you need to leave sufficient time for that stuff. 
I would say on average of all the pitches I've been to with publishers, I'm usually out of there in 45 to 50 minutes, but that includes the conversations and the setup of the equipment and, and all that stuff. So it's kind of the whole, the whole thing. I'd say 45, 50 minutes average. All right. All right. So this is the last one. Unless, so if you've got questions for, you know, Jason, pop them in here now or, you know, forever hold your peace. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think of VR chat meetings? Or if you're in a vir if you are a virtual content creator and a game dev, would a virtual persona work well? With current technology, you can really have a full virtual environment, even in Zoom, where it feels and looks like a conference room. I part of me wants to believe in that. I, I've never done it. I don't want to speak from a, a place of authority here. There is until we get, you know, ready player one level actual method of virtual communication, it will always be better to be in person. I fully believe that. That said, if you're in a faraway place or if there's a global pandemic going on, would you rather have, you know, I, it feels gimmicky to me. I, even if you're a VR developer, if the VR product you're making isn't specifically a VR chat or social app, I, I don't know. I, you know, VR money is, is, is still, you know, being distributed around the industry to some extent, but I think people are a little bit more discerning these days about like just throwing it randomly. I think it's best if for you to come off as like a very serious like partner in that situation. And in those cases, I, I would just rely on the, the zoom meetings or, or just kind of a face to face thing. I that's take that with a grain of salt. I, I haven't done it before. I haven't even been asked to do it. I would try it if the person in question was interested. I have a set, but I don't know. It feels, feels a little gimmicky to me. I mean, unless you're, I mean, my take on it is unless you're pitching something that is in, you know, VR, it is. I mean, one, you're, you're not a hundred percent sure that whoever you're meeting with is going to have the same equipment or the proper equipment or the, yeah, there's, there's you know, the you're just throwing more potential wrenches into the gears there. Um, so yeah. to clarify an earlier question, uh, quartering spam from Twitch was talking about, you know, setting up the spaces to do the pitch, actually talking about virtual pitches like this, you know, should they have the camera away from them like you are right now? So it looks like you're actually giving a pitch or, you know, well, in part, I mean, up in the face or how, how should you set it up? It's a, it's a good question. And I haven't done a ton of these because I actually, I got funded in January and then the pandemic happened, but I didn't need to pitch anymore because I did it. Um, what's interesting is that in this case, you know, I thought about how I would set, I'm in my, my living room down here. Uh, you know, I have an office, but we can't use it. Um, I realized that because I have you and Dan helping me set up with the picture in picture thing where you can see both me and the presentation at the same time, that's pretty much the ideal scenario. Um, if you're doing a more traditional pitch, I would say it's like what, what I would do in that case is I would connect to this television. I would have the presentation here and I would be giving it just like I would in real life, like pointing at the screen here, kind of standing a little bit off to the side, kind of going to the points. It might be a little, like try and have the screen fill up most of the camera because you want them to be able to read the bullet points because it's no longer a direct it's like a camera of a camera screen of a screen type thing. Um, but of course, remember, you are sending this material to them in the follow up. You're sending them the pitch deck. You're sending them everything right afterwards. So if they didn't maybe see anything or if they want to take a better look at that concept art in slide four, that's cool. They're going to be able to get to. That's, I think, how I would do it because um, we don't all have uh, great Dan's and Jay's there to, to help out with the AV setup. Um, it's, it's tempting to just screen share because it removes the onus from you to have to do all the stuff that I basically talked about today, where it's, they're just gonna be focused on the slides and your voice, and they're not gonna be focused on your body language and who you are. But if you are even remotely decent at that stuff, it is a huge leg up and I wouldn't give that up. I wouldn't give up being able to have them see you and you look directly into the camera back at them. All right, I was just saying, there was another one and I lost it, but I found it now. What do you do to keep yourself from worrying or getting too excited or too stressed when waiting to hear back from a publisher? Because as we all know, it can take time to hear back from a publisher. Yeah, I mean, first off, half of them are basically going to ghost you. 
they just they are even you're like you know so, so okay this is something i didn't mention i probably should have send a quick follow-up when you're done um not immediately immediately but probably same day just send an email and say hey guys really appreciate you having me in uh, it was great meeting you and Mike and Steve, however many names you remember. Um, looking forward to hearing from you and possibly working with you in the future. Blah, just generic thank you stuff. Then time will pass. <laughs> um, you're not going to hear anything from them. Uh, I think, you know, the appropriate poking time, it's worth poking. Um, three, three weeks maybe is a poke, maybe four, depending on who it is. Um, that said, is if it's like a genuinely like good pitch and they respond to you and they're like, hey, we're really good. We're thank you so much. We're going to share this with the higher ups. We thought it was a great pitch, blah, blah, blah. Don't get too excited about that. They, a lot of them say that anyway. Um, and then you have to wait. Right. And then you you have to sit there and just hope your your phone makes a little sound one day and that the, the pitch they say they they're going to do it. And like, it took me years and years and years to finally get that. And I was driving at the time and it was very dangerous and I almost died because I was losing my mind. Um, just, I mean, just, just to, you can't do anything else at that point. Right. You can, if, if you realize that maybe you can improve something, if you stumbled on some part, or if you think that that one slide, you, you felt like you were losing the crowd a little bit, go ahead and make those changes. That's something productive you can do. But after that, there's not much left. You have to just wait. And just from a, a mental health perspective, it's not good to sit there and just check your phone or refresh an email page every five seconds. What you should be doing is A, enjoying your life if possible. Uh, B, maybe working on a side project. If there's another game that you were thinking about, you know, get your mind off things by making a new prototype. Just play, you know, Cyberpunk 2077. I don't know. Um, just you got to find some way to not do that because that is a very, I think, mentally unhealthy place to be where you're just checking and checking and checking for a few years. I, like I said, I did not get any of those, the emails that you want to get. I didn't get a single one and it sucks. Um, but you, you know, you gotta, you gotta keep going. So, so my advice was to spend that time pitching to more publishers. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. You know, if you, if you can like do as many of those as you can. The, the thing to keep in mind, you know, Oblitus is, you know, we used to say, I mean, for 23 years that I've been doing this, the average time it takes to get a publisher signed from the day you send out that demo to the day the contract signed is three months. You know, I've had them take nine months. I've had them take three weeks. But yeah. now with the pandemic and the sheer volume of games that publishers are seeing, it takes longer. You know, it's, it's, I would easily say it's a four month average at this point. And then on top of that, you've got, just the, like I said, the sheer number of these things that are coming in, plus whatever else is going on in the pandemic and things just take a little longer. So it's definitely not one of those where, you know, we, we suggest you keep poking people every week going, have you read it? Have you read yeah. it? Was, like yeah. I think one poke after three to four weeks, maybe a second poke if you truly hear nothing back. But if like, if they didn't respond in three weeks and then they didn't respond to a single poke after another couple of weeks, like, are they going to say yes to your game? Possibly it's rare. It might be worth a second poke, but yeah, do not do it constantly. It is annoying. Um, yeah, it takes, I mean, the, the question of how long did it take for me pitching my game? It, I had a very strange relationship. This is, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. This is one of, this is a, from my knowledge, maybe Jay can correct me. This was very rare. Um, all right, I pitched, okay, I'm gonna tell the whole story. I'm sorry, I know we're going over time, but um, I pitched this game to this publisher in late 2017. So I, I already pitched a previous game to them. They said no. I pitched a game in late 2017. They looked at it. They seemed really interested. It seemed like really positive. I was feeling good about it. After four months, that was December 2017. In April 2018, they said, we're really sorry. We just didn't have it in the budget. We feel really bad. I was devastated. I sent a follow-up email and this, you know, you can do this too. Be like, Hey, I'm really sorry to hear that. I do understand. Uh, is there anything you felt like maybe was lacking that I could work on in the future? It's always good to ask that, you know, you want to try and get their rationale. The guy was like, honestly, no, like we really loved it. We just didn't have it in us. And I was like, okay, great. Pretty devastated. Won't lie. Um, pick, you know, pick myself up, pitched around to many more people. And then um, in 2018, thanks to Barack Obama in 2014, 
uh, we are able to go to Cuba. I promise this is relevant. Uh, my family from South Florida wanted to take a vacation and wanted to go to Cuba, which we can now do. So I said, okay, I went with my mom and my brother and my sister, we went to Cuba. We're taking a bus tour around Cuba. We see some cool stuff. At the very end, the bus that we're on stops at a marketplace. They say, hey guys, if you want any of the stereotypical Cuban goods, coffee, rum, and cigars, here's the place to get it. You have 15 minutes, be back on this bus in 15 minutes or we're leaving you in Cuba. And I was like, cool. Just for the record, I don't actually smoke, drink, or do any of that. I, I like coffee, but I was like, whatever, I don't want coffee. So I actually sat on the bus for 10 minutes. And then I realized after 10 minutes that I'm an idiot and you can't import Cuban cigars. So I was like, I should just go get Cuban cigars. I don't smoke them, but I can give them as business gifts. So I like ran off the bus. Luckily, I speak a good amount of Spanish. And I like quickly bought a couple of boxes of, of cigars with, with the Cuban local currency. Got back on the bus right before I left and then went back to the States. I thought about who to give those cigars to. They're rare. They're hard to get. I thought about those people at this publisher who were very nice to me, that guy who sent me that email. I said, hey, man, uh, are you at the office? I just thought I'd bring by a little gift. I was I was in Cuba. I got some cigars. He was like, oh, yeah, man, cool. I went and dropped them off. When I dropped them off, he was happy to see me, he smiled, you know, whatever. And then randomly, he was like, hey, are you going to that launch party tonight for one of our games that I can't say? And I was like, no, <laughs> I haven't talked to this guy in like six months. He was like, oh, yeah, uh, you, should, you should totally come by. It's super fun. It's at this address in Los Angeles. And I was like, OK, that night. I went to this place. They were a little bit drunk, not like crazy drunk, but they were drunk. And it was the first time I'd met any of them in a casual environment. I talked to them about the game. They were like, yeah, man, we were like really excited about that game. It was like super bummer. Have you been working on it? And I was like, yeah, you know, I've, I've done some improvements to the art. I actually finished the script to the game. And they're like, oh, cool. You like finished the script. That's cool. Like you should like send that over, man. And I was like, okay, sure. I actually hadn't finished the script. I was 50 pages from the end. So I pulled an all-nighter that night to finish the script super quickly. I sent it off to them the next day. This reinvigorated the talks between us. They were like, we're going to be honest with you. We really liked your game. Everything about it was great. We didn't love the art. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you X dollars to work on the art. That's it. We don't work on anything else. Music, writing, gameplay, design, nothing. Just the art. Find artists, work on the art. Find a unique style, find something that works because we didn't love the art. That's what we were worried about. I said, cool. They gave me six months to do that basically. And then finally in December, 2019, I presented again, my final presentation with the art that their money paid for. They said, if we don't like it, we'll say, no, you don't owe us the money back. But if we like it, we'll go forward with it for full funding. Uh, I pitched it on December 17th. And then they said, we, uh, we're gonna take some time to think about it. Uh, I was like, cool. I was expecting to wait. I was expecting to just distract myself for a month or two. And then the next day on the 405, I got the email. So that was a very uncommon situation where like they gave me money to do art, which is not common. And they gave me kind of a deadline to do that. So this, this was not a standard scenario for most pitches, certainly. Uh, but that's what happened. Sorry. I was just rambling for five minutes. That's, that's what occurred. So, I mean, does that happen where, you know, publishers come back after they said they're not interested and they decide they are interested? Yes, that does happen. It's not completely unusual because circumstances change. They may have had something that slipped. They may have had somebody go out of business. Now, does the random occurrence to find a cigar shed in Cuba and remember to get you know, some cigars for a random publisher that you met with that leads to a deal happen. No, you, you pretty much got a rare one there, Jason, that, that, part, that part you're good on. Yeah, that one's, that one's not common. Um, but, but there is a general message there, right? The general message of like, stay in contact with these people and like continue to, to, if not like, I didn't send them an email and I was like, hey guys, did you change your mind? Like, that's a little weird and awkward. And like, they're like, you know, they might just be like, well, we made a decision. No, that's stop asking. But I was just like, I just want to get him something nice. Maybe you get him some uh, donuts one time. I don't know. That's a little weird too. I don't know. Just be nice to people. Just be nice. It, 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 Going it, back to the point that you mentioned early and, and that I just hammer into people when they're new to the industry is you never burn bridges. Never burn bridges. Yeah. Never. There's no reason to do that. And you never know what weird Cuban cigar related event will happen. You don't know. Sure, my one thing is rare and weird, but 
eventually something rare and weird will probably happen and you just need to have all those options open to you. Always be ready. Well, dude, I highly appreciate this. This has been great. A um, lot of folks coming in here and, and chiming in and, and commenting on how wonderful a presentation this was, wow. which one would be expecting from a presentation on, you know, how to pitch. So yeah, really bad if it was in Congress. I know, that would have been awkward. That would, that, could have gotten really out of hand. <laughs> uh, but I mean, that's it for today, folks. I mean, that's uh, day one of the Indie Game Business Sessions Winter 2020 session in the books. We will be back bright and early at eight o'clock Eastern time tomorrow morning. We've got talks coming up from Jordan Morris. Actually, our highest, most anticipated talk, uh, how to build an audience for your game as an indie developer on social media. Uh, we've got Natasha Scott from Metail, a wonderful panel from the from the gamers, the game hers. I can never get that emphasized. It looks it's easier to figure out in writing. Um, we've got Jay Shin from Arrogant Pixel, Chris Zukowski talking about marketing, Jen Verrier on IP licensing. Yeah. My good friend Heather Chandler, who is going to be discussing building a budget for your indie game. Uh, Jason. Schickler, I'm Jason. I'm sure I just butchered your name, but you know you, you'll be okay. You love me, uh, and then uh, Nathan Blair from from Games for Love is going to be wrapping it up tomorrow. So we got tomorrow, and then we got Thursday as well. Um, we're going to let y'all all go for now. Jason, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, we'll see y'all manana. See you guys. <laughs>